Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains in Missouri, USA. Well, you might be able to tell from this table load of junk behind me that it's time for another Ferengi Friday. Well, I guess the title might have given it away too. At any rate, let's jump right in and start opening some of this stuff up and see what's here. And I thought maybe this time we'd try to change things up a little bit and we'll pick out one or two little items and take an extra close look at them. Let's get started. Here are just a few of the circuit boards I've had made recently by PCBWay, who is nice enough to sponsor this video. So whether you need a few boards or a lot of boards, check out PCBWay. So head on over to PCBWay and get your instant quote on standard circuit boards, flex circuit boards, assembly, and they now also offer rapid prototyping so you can get your mechanical parts made as well. That's an awesome service. So for your next project, head on over to PCB Way. This pile of TRS-80 Model 100 stuff all came from the original owner, and it's great when you can pick up things that way. Now, I already took this out of the box because somebody I know was looking for some moving boxes, but I haven't really looked at it too close, so let's jump in and have a closer look. Okie doke. Let's have a look inside this nice hard case. And you see these even said Radio Shack on the top. And if we open it up, we see lots of nice crumbling foam. Sadly, this is what happens to all of these guys. But inside, we've got the original matching Radio Shack computer cassette recorder. And I was looking what these went for separately on eBay, and it's amazing. Now this does have some black fuzzy stuff from our foam all over it, but it looks like it's in really good shape, but I'm sure this will clean up well. We also have our Model 100 here. In its real genuine leather case, this is also in good shape. Now the owner tells me the LCD on this is kind of flickering. And I would guess that has to do with it needing some new capacitors. This is one of the few machines I think you should go ahead and recap when you get it because they're all going to need it. So I'll do that sometime in the near future. And the other exciting bit is just everything in the case. Now while this is deteriorated, you can kind of see where all the different compartments were. And I think with some pictures that I found online, I might be able to do a, a fairly good job of recreating this. I've already got the foam. I just need to make some templates and cut things out and, and glue it. Uh, inside, we have a couple Radio Shack C20 computer cassettes. This looks like it has maybe some email type stuff on it. Yeah, that does too. And I found out from the previous owner of these, he actually used these as a sales engineer for a company he worked for. And he would take his Model 100 out into the field when he did uh, troubleshooting and sales calls and remote back into Linux desktop machines uh, to do some things and to demonstrate it to the clients. And this also has the uh, modem couplers. That's kind of neat how to save space. They just did individual couplers with a cable to hook everything together. Got the power supply, more crumbling foam. This is the other part of the modem with the coupler on it. This is a modem cable, cassette cable, and the power cord for the cassette deck. So I look forward to going through this and figuring out how to redo this case. I think that'll be nice. And having the original matching tape deck is really awesome as well. Now, this fella did a great job shipping everything. Well, he did use the world's most annoying uh, packing peanuts. Everything arrived safely. And he wrapped up the individual things in plastic bags and plastic wrap. And lots of bubble wrap so the peanuts didn't get inside this stuff. He was really thinking ahead. And there's lots of good documentation and things in here. Let's get these all out of the bag. 
Okay, first we have this really nice TRS-80 software library. You had a place to store your cassettes, your printed documentation, and this one happens to be the Model 100 Basic Language Lab. Now these are available, you know, as PDFs online, but it's such a treat to have an original in the original binder in such good condition. And it even has the cassette to go with it. A classic TRS-80 book, The Hidden Powers of the Model 100. These are a very desirable item. Some Model 100 graphics worksheets. I imagine these are photocopies. Yep, lots of photocopies of those. And, oh, I didn't notice this before. Oh, a little pamphlet of the, the Model 100 ROM functions. Again, these are available as PDFs, but having them in the original print form is nice. Some of the original stuff that would have came with the computer, the quick reference guide, the applications quick reference, the manual for the cassette recorder, and the actual Model 100 manual. This is in really excellent shape. It's nearly like new. It's been really well taken care of. The pages aren't yellowed. Just an excellent, excellent shape. And we've got a smaller software library, still in the nice little binder here. It's got the executive calendar tape, TRC to Model 100 portable computer executive calendar. So this looks to be some type of daily planner type software and calendar application. This is something we take for granted, kind of being built into every office package now, and this is really something new back in the day. Another classic book, Lance Leventhal's 8080 and 8085 assembly language routines. This is nice to have an actual physical hard copy of. Uh, Leventhal really put out a bunch of books for many of the different uh, popular processors back in the day that were kind of all in the same template. So if you've read one, it's really easy to use the others as a reference. And we have the games and utilities for the Model 100. This is a list of basic programs that you can type in. Again, it's in really nice shape. And the piece de resistance. An actual physical copy of the TRS-80 Model 100 reference manual. These are available online. Some of the scans are not too good. And this is just perfect. Now if I had some type of document scanner where I could do high resolution scans of these without tearing this up, I sure would, but I just don't want to debind this. It's in such good shape. That's quite a treat. I'm very happy with that. Being able to get a whole system like this from the original owner is a treat. And it's well worth paying a few extra dollars to get that because it's in good shape. You've got a lot of extra documentation with it and you get a chance to you know, meet the owner, learn something about it, and learn how they used the equipment back in the day. And I think that part is priceless. Well, what do you say we move on to the next item and see what that is? Well, here we have a familiar brown box that says Epson on it. And if we open it up, you probably won't be surprised to find another HX20. Now, this one has a floppy space bar because I took it apart and I swiped the switch out of there for a friend. It had a bad space bar key and I f found out with some help of somebody on Twitter what these keys are so hopefully I can uh, find another replacement for this. This is one of the rare good buys on eBay and I bought it you know intending just to use it for parts. It was really cheap and it turns out it's in fairly good shape so you know, maybe we can get this going. It did have some tapes with it. It says BTR version 1.0, KBD, sensor cal. This says sensor diagnostics on the cassette in here. So I'm thinking this was used for some type of equipment, you know, some type of equipment control. 
which is what a lot of these you know, early machines like this were used for because they were relatively cheap and relatively portable. So I wonder if we open up the ROM drawer down here, if we'll find a custom EEPROM in here. No, that's just kind of the regular old Ski Writer EEPROM. So maybe they use some software that they loaded on the machine by cassette. Not sure. I'll try popping this guy open. So we'll try popping this guy open. And no, nope, that's just the regular 6301 in there, nothing special. There we go. So at least there's no custom software on here via ROM. And I also found out that when these didn't have the expansion unit on here, there's actually a cover for that. But at any rate, I'll get this fixed up sometime when I find another spacebar switch. And then I've got the expansion unit left from that, you know, crazy sensor apparatus we looked at a few months ago. So I might be able to make one more complete unit, but I don't have the brackets to hook the expansion unit to this. So maybe I can 3D print something or something like that. So what is all this craziness? I left the bubble wrap on just to kind of disguise it. Again, I took it out of the big box because somebody I know was needing moving boxes. Let's go ahead and get the bubble wrap. The bubble wrap. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get the bubble wrap off of here so we can see what it is. So what the heck is this big giant heavy thing? Well, it is a Beckman System Gold Programmable Solvent Module. And what the heck is that? Well, I really don't know. I, I didn't want this thing. It was big and heavy and it cost a little bit to ship. And, but it came with something I did want. And the thing I did want actually connected to this. So I thought, well, maybe it'd be kind of interesting to see what the desirable thing that connected to this, what it did. Now this is some type of chemical processing equipment. You know, it's got various valves and solenoids and flopping around parts and things like that. A little plastic baggie filled with stuff. So, some type of valve thing here, a block of something. Have a squeeze at the back too. Okay, and here is the back of our happy little unit. This fan housing is slightly rusted and very dirty, so this thing's been used a lot. It'll run on 100 to 240 volts. It's got a configurable power input here. Got some other type of core thing in here. It's covered by a lot of patents. And it has a remote I.O. connector, a controller out, a controller in connector, and a reset. And an address. So this is something you can connect a lot of different pieces of equipment together. And on the back it just again says 116 programmable solvent solvent module. I think maybe this was used for some type of chemical assay equipment to figure out what other stuff was. And the cord that was hooked up to this, these are the two cords that came with it, a power cord and a serial cord to this controller in. So the controller that came with this was the part I wanted. So that hooked up like that. And this is a power jack, so this must have powered the controller too, which is kind of interesting. But you see our cord's not like super duper long here. So they meant the controller to be kind of close to this. I don't have any idea what I'm going to do with this. Um, maybe we'll take it apart to see what the parts are in there. And I don't know if anybody knows what the heck this thing was used for. I'm sure it was expensive and very useful back in the day if you did that type of work, but 
please let us know in the comments below. I would be curious. But now, let's look at the controller that connected to this thing, because that was the piece I was interested in. Okay, and here's our mystery controller. I bet you can kind of guess what it is, even without a super stealthy camouflage bubble wrap. It is an NEC PC8300, which is kind of uh, one of the computers that Kyocera made that all start out with a TRS-80 Model 100. Now, I saw pictures of this powered up, so I know it works. Um, it's a little dirty. Not too bad a physical shape, though. It's got most of the cover still on here. And this was used to run that piece of test equipment, which is kind of interesting. Oh, look, they made a... <laughs> they added a power plug right to the batter cassette rather than using the one that was right on the back. Isn't that interesting? It's kind of an odd way to do things. So, these PC8300s kind of go for silly money anymore. And I didn't really want to pay that. And I found these two units together, this in that piece of test equipment and I got both for less than what you normally get the 8300s for and I thought well, at least it would be kind of interesting to see what this did to control that piece of test equipment and you know that type of thing that might make an interesting video there might be some you know interesting custom EEPROMs in here that type of thing and we'll get this fixed up and then I'll have that to go along with the PC 8201A and the Model 100 and that type of thing, and this neat slab top form factor. And it's a little dirty, it's slightly yellow, but, you know, there's a few scuffs and stuff, but it's in pretty good shape. And it's kind of interesting that I was hooked to a piece of, you know, chemical test equipment. So happy to get that. Now we've got a couple small boxes, let's have a look at those. Next, we have this funny stack of Commodore calculators. Now this was listed online in an auction by a small auction company that does, you know, estate sales and stuff, and they listed stuff online. And they would ship, and the pictures were kind of sad, and it said two new calculators. So you can see it still has the lot number on here. And then when it came, it was taped up like this, and it's, I think there's three, two in a box and one on top, but I don't know. So I thought we'd kind of untape these and look inside the boxes together and see what was in there. Hopefully we can get this off of here without damaging the boxes. At least they used painter's tape and not packing tape. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Just a little bit of stuff off there, but not too bad. And if we can get this off of here without damage, we'll be in good shape. We'll go peel away from the corner, kind of like this. Oh, there we go. Excellent. So I think these are all the same. It's a Commodore 774D. And this one was owned by John Lennon. I don't know. Or John Lennon. This one was owned by Lennon. I don't know if it was John Lennon. I doubt it. And it took a 9-volt battery, and that's not all corroded in there, so these might actually work. Now, I don't know if these are actually new. If these are new, then I got a decent price. If they're not new, then I got not such a good price. Oh, I do think these are new. Look at that. Let's have a look inside. So, let's open these up. Let's see what is on the inside. So evidently they used these same boxes for different models since they just stamped the model on there. We've got our Commodore Electronic Calculators Guide Operating Instructions. To explain all four functions. And some cardboardy stuff here, which, there we go. Oh, look at that. 
vintage plastic bag. And a little sticker on there that says, Calculate your profits with baggies. I have no idea what that means. Yeah, this is definitely a new unit, and there's another baggy sticker on the bag. Food baggies, food storage bags. So were these a giveaway from some food bag company? That's very strange. It has an external power jack. It's absolutely no frills, just four functions. No memory, no nothing. Well, I've never heard of the brand Baggies before. Is that something any of you guys recognize? It kind of looks like a, a fake brand. Huh. Let's, uh... Oh, there we go. Brand new virgin battery compartment. Luckily, I just got some new 9 volt batteries because otherwise I would have been out. I'll hook up our 9 volt battery, pop it in there, and let's see if it works. It does not. Look at that. Oh, there it goes. Can you see it? Behold the power. There's a zero there. One, two, three, four, plus four. Five, six, seven, eight equals sixty-nine, twelve. It's got the little bubble LEDs in there. How cool is that? Times nine equals sixty-two, two hundred eight. Well, it works. A brand new old Commodore four-function calculator. That is quite a treat. Let's see if the other one in the box is the same. Yeah, I think maybe the switch was just a little dirty the first time. Oh, excellent. I'm very happy I bid on these now. Never know sometimes what you're going to get. Well, let's have a look at our second box now. This has an old label on it that says new four or three dollars. Somebody must have tried to sell these at a yard sale or something. Or I guess a, a boot sale if you're in the UK. Got the manual in there like the other one. And there we go. Yep, this also has a $3 new sticker on it. This one doesn't have the baggies. Oh, it did have the baggies label on there. Somebody took the baggage label off. Guess they thought that would hinder them hawking the calculator. Well, this screen has some rub marks on it, but it's not dirty, so this one may have been used, at least used a little bit. Boy, these battery compartments are hard to get open. There we go. Yeah, this is still nice and clean inside. Hook up our battery. And give her a whirl. Yeah, see, this one's doing the same. Oh, there we go. It just takes a while. Got to get just the right angle on these guys to see it. I'm trying to... Get rid of the glare. And so we can both see. Looks like all the segments work. Divide by four equals. Yeah. All right. So these two new ones, it looks like everything works. And in person, those digits look nice and bright. They look fairly good in the camera as well. well that's kind of a treat. A couple of new inbox. Commodore four banger calculators. Let's try that used one. Let's see how we fare with it. Okay, here's our used one that belonged to linen. 
Not John Lennon. This name could have been named John. I don't know. Could have been Joe. Yeah, see that one kind of flickered there a little bit. It's hard to see on camera, but that one digit looks kind of bright. And yeah, we've got a missing segment there. Look at that. Yeah, right there. We've got a top missing on the eight. Squeeze in here, and that's not doing any good. So, oh yeah, look, there's got. I think maybe we're just messing up the power switch there. So we may have to pop that open to see if we can fix that one digit. But other than that, I'd say they're all three in good shape. That is a treat. Okay, well, we'll put linen away and take a look at our last box and see what's in there. I'm not quite sure myself. Okay, here we've got a box all the way from Germany. And my friend and yours, Sven Peterson. Now, we agreed to trade Pick two chips, a PAL chip from him for an NTSC chip from me, because we both wanted to make one of the opposite C64s. And he said he threw in some extra goodies as a surprise, and I did too. So I don't know exactly what's in here. Let's dump it all out and have a look. Well, instead of dumping, let's just take it like this. Oh, goodness. What do we have here? Oh, this looks like a kit of stuff. It's got a DIN connector, a little board. Let's get the boards out of there and see if we can figure out what that is. I'll set that big box to the side. What is this? I see some project building in my future. Here's one board. Ah, there's another board. There's some edge connectors. Is this like a user port and cassette and a DB9 connection? And oh, there's a th third board in there. That is a cassette pass through. And spiffy blackboards. Ah, VIC 20 diagnostic set. Super freaking cool. Yeah, keyboard dongle, cassette dongle, and the user port dongle. Oh, we're going to have to build that in an upcoming episode. That is super nifty. I do have some VIC-20s to work on that I just haven't gotten to yet. All right. That will be a lot of fun. And what do we have here? Well, there is a chip and a crystal. So this is going to be our... Moss 6569 R3. This is our PAL C64. VIC 2, along with its crystal. I'm just going to go ahead and leave that in the anti static bag there to keep it nice and safe. You probably can't see it as well as I can. And, you know, we can do a quick episode in the near future on converting an NTSC machine to PAL, or it'll work the same way if you're going the other direction. And we'll see how that works. And I'm not quite sure how my Extron video scaler will work with the C64 PAL signal, but we'll find out. It'll be a lot of fun. And what do we have here? Well, this is some other circuit boards. Baggy here. And... What is this? Oh, this is one of the Diag 64 carts he made. He added some switches to the side so you can change it to dead test or diagnostic. And I forget what this switch does. It may be for a couple other things. So you can add an EEPROM here and change the modes. Uh, VersaCart 64. These are awesome. I was uh, talking about in another video how I want to build one of these for a C128 uh, diagnostics cart. 
that would be perfect for that because the C128s are uh, configured a little differently than a C64 cart. And an FX fast load cart remake on a spiffy block board. Nifty. Those will be fun to build. Looks like Sven has been busy creating circuit boards. He does such a great job. And here is some other parts. Some switches and diodes and chips. I don't know what this is. Oh, lots of stuff falling out here. Let's see if we can get the, the big stuff out. Okay, this is some 6526 RAM, Super Expansion RAM Diagnostics PAL for NTSC. Okay, this must be some of the parts for the other circuit boards, maybe? It's got some jumpers. Yeah, this must be parts for some of these other circuit boards. Although, I'm not sure what these RAMs are for. I think those are for the VIC-20 RAM expansion. I didn't pay attention on that VIC-20 diagnostic. I don't think there's a place for a RAM expansion on there. No, those are just dongles so the we can configure the super cart for the VIC-20 diagnostics. So I'm not quite sure what these are for. I'll have to read the directions. Perish the thought. Get all those parts put back in there. That is awesome. A lot of neat projects coming up. Oh gosh! <laughs> that might answer some of the questions. There's more stuff in the bottom here. Look at, oh, look at that. That is one of his 3D printed cases. And a VIC-20 diagnostic harness. Oh my goodness. That is super awesome. So now our VIC-20 diagnostic set will have a home. Now he's got all of these files, the case files, some super excellent documentation all on his GitHub. And I will put the link to that in the description down below. So if you want to build one of these yourself, uh, go take a look at that. If you're thinking, hey, I want to buy one of those from somebody, well, if you look in the documentation, it'll give you an idea of what the parts cost. And it'll give you an idea of maybe what you should expect to pay. Now, if somebody's building it, they've got other expenses involved too, like, you know, ordering the parts and the shipping and all their time building it and testing it. So keep that in mind, but don't pay a silly price on eBay. You know, just make an informed choice, I guess is what I'm saying. And, oh, this is one of his, yeah, this is one of his S-Video boards. These are so nicely done. It plugs right into the back of your C64 and has all the connectors to break out the AV. So this is a much more slick and integrated system than my uh, S-Video cable I made. And he's got all the parts for it right there, the board and the connectors and the whole nine yards. That'll be another fun build. Wow. And there's still a few more things in here. Oh, that's the case for the uh, VIC-20 cassette dongle. Super awesome. And as nifty labels he makes for those. And this is what some of those chips were for. Yes. Okay. And there's some screws in there for all that stuff, too. Okay. I can see, says the blind man. This is one of his VIC-20 hyper expanders. That really will deck a VIC-20 out with all the RAM and stuff you could possibly imagine. Yes. So you've got a nifty clear case that goes in. A really spiffy looking circuit board. Yeah, this is where our RAM chips goes. That's what those two RAM chips are for. Oh, RAM and RAM, ROM, and our glue logic and uh, diodes. 
resistor network, a reset switch type of switch here, and there's some jumpers here for EEPROM config. That is a really nice looking board. And on the back, he has all the legends for how to set everything up. Tells you what each of these parts are required for. It's required if you're using high RAM or low RAM. Where to put your jumpers. That is a really nice touch. It's really well thought out. Very nice looking board. And it pops right into the case. Like so. Fits like a glove. Well, that'll be awesome. Well, you know what this means. Now it means I'm going to have to break out a VIC-20 and go through it and then build the diagnostic harness and then build this thing and have some fun. All right. That'll be awesome. Thanks a lot, Sven. This is great. Wow. That's quite a lot of goodies in there. So what do you say... Um, we take that one Commodore calculator apart that has the missing segment and we'll see if we can fix it. If not, at least we got to see inside of one. What do you think? I think we can do that pretty quick. Okie doke. Let's see what we can do here. Got a little pencil mark or something there. Take our cover off. Looks like there's one Phillips screw there. And maybe some latches down here. So maybe this isn't too bad. We'll see if we can fix up old linen here. Oh, there we go. Okay. And we've got a main circuit board right here. Some really cheap flex cable going to the keyboard. And we have our LED module here. And Carefully fold him open. Yeah, we have a calculator ASIC here. Now this looks like it was made in 75. I think Commodore originally bought their calculator chips from TI. And when TI decided they would rather make calculators than just sell the chips, uh, that is when Commodore bought MOS to make their own calculator chips and eventually got into making computers. Here is our little bubble LED module. I wonder if I can get zoomed in on that. Ooh, that is very blurry. Yeah, you can almost see each little LED dot in there. Let's see if we can hook the 9 volt up. You notice there's really nothing in here. There is a calculator chip. And I'm guessing this is a display driver. And the LED and our keyboard. Okay. There we go. Yeah, you can see just that that segment's missing. Well, it could be in the LED module itself. It could be the driver. I'm applying some pressure here. 
solder joints. It's not coming on my wig on yet, so I'm going to guess we've got a bad LED segment. But we have to find the documentation for this matrix so we can test that with the diode check function to be sure. So we can at least have a look at the solder joints on the bottom. I've been looking at this under my magnifier here. And you can't really see it in the video. There's a little fleck of solder right here. But I don't think that was really causing a problem. And, you know, all the solder joints look okay. I don't see any breaks or cracks. Any dry joints, that type of thing. So I think we just have a case of a bad LED segment, but I will see if I can find a some type of diagram for this LED module so we can check it further. Well, how about that? It just started working. I haven't really done anything. So I guess our LED is okay. And maybe we had a fleck of something in the wrong spot. Maybe it just started working because the chip warmed up. Maybe the LED was cranky after not being used for 30 years. I don't know. But it is working now. So I guess as a test, we can turn it off and let it cool down and turn it back on and see what it does. Okay, I've given it about five minutes for the chips to cool to the touch. We'll turn it on. Punch in a bunch of eights and yep, it's all working. Maybe there's just a fleck of some schmaltz in there that was causing a problem with that one segment. I don't know. It's working out. I can't make it stop working, which is rather disappointing when that happens, but I guess I'll take it over it being permanently broke. Awesome. Three cute little Commodore four banger calculators. Can't beat that with a stick. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. That was a lot of fun. Take a look at all this stuff that just came in. We got to see the inside of an old Commodore four banger calculator and how simple they were made. And this one even magically started working again. Got a lot of nice projects from Sven Peterson. I think one of the first things I might do is convert my C64 to PAL. That'll be a lot of fun, and we'll get to see how it works on the Xtron and see what the process is. And I've got this PC8300 now to play with and go along with my collection, which is a nice addition. And we can tear apart this old chemical thing, the doodah, and see what's inside it. Maybe try to figure out what it did. I'm sure that was a very expensive piece of kit back in the day. If you have any questions or comments, well, I would sure love to hear from you. Just leave them in the comments section down below. I'd like to take a moment to say... Thanks, a big thanks to everyone who helps support the Hey Burt channel through Patreon and other means. If you have any interest in that, well, there's some links in the description down below. And until next time, bye.